do what they want to do. I have had a chicken that is scared of worms. Oh no. How does it eat if it's scared of worms? <laughs> we just feed it different things. <laughs> Chickens are a very good judge of character. They know someone who's not going to harm them and someone who's safe. I tuck them in every night. We have to talk about Tony Atwood when we talk about Asperger's syndrome and autism. If it hadn't been for Tony and the way that he can communicate, we wouldn't have the understanding that we do now to help so many people around the world. Although you're good at understanding chickens, what other people are thinking and feeling may be difficult for you at times. Yeah. We use the term Asperger's syndrome for what may be called high-functioning autism. It's a different way of perceiving, thinking, learning, and relating. So that part of the brain is not working as it does in most people. That's what we consider the most crucial difference. And you were hurting yourself on your I own. I would bite around there. I would just bite it and bite it and bite it. And I didn't really feel the pain, so I'm like, this works. Life with Asperger's is, is, is not all wonderful. But by nature, I'm an optimist. And I have an optimistic view of what can be achieved. He understands my autism yep. and he gives me tools to use to help with it. And he's kind of my go-to guy. A chicken's love is its superpower. Autism is mine. Yeah, I agree with you. Use it wisely because it'll give you talents and abilities. Tony Atwood was really the first clinical psychologist in the world to look at Asperger traits as assets and not as something to be fixed, something to be congratulated for, something to be enjoyed in the person's life. And we always look for those gifts, those strengths and abilities that the person has because they're always there. I think people with autism are incredibly brave in just coping with life. Coping with the challenges, not just the social and the conversational, but to just get your thoughts and feelings across to other people. Tony has been at the cutting edge research over the last three decades. He can tell our story in a way that is real, that doesn't fudge the challenges, but he never loses hope. The special interest gives you a sense of identity, success, but it's also a blocker of negative emotions. I think many of the heroes in life and the greatest scientists and artists actually have Asperger's syndrome. Vincent van Gogh and Andy Warhol had many of those characteristics. Another component is if you are imitating others and copying them, you do literally win Oscars. And that's where we think Laurence Olivier and Peter Sellers had many Asperger features. So I think there are many advantages in us embracing Asperger syndrome and welcoming that different way of thinking. We're ready? So we'll just go in. And there's lots of toys to play with in here. Leah is two years, 11 months old. Now she has several siblings with autism, so there's a possibility of what we call recurrence. Wow. I think you're more interested in the house than playing with me. She won't get involved with playing with the other kids and she won't, if, she, if it's not what she wants to do, she's no interest yeah. at all. Do you know what that is? In the house. Can you tell me, Leah? There are many more children being diagnosed today because we're better at doing the diagnosis. It might be, you know, one in a hundred, it might be one in 68, it might be one in 98, just depending on who's, who's done the figures. Early diagnosis and early intervention is crucial. Oh God, some new toys. Her self-imposed isolation, her emotionality and rigidity, her difficulties in reading social situations suggests that she may be what we call on the spectrum. There's two terms you'll come across, Aspie meaning a person with Asperger's syndrome or your neurotypical, someone who doesn't have Asperger's syndrome. 
Look at that! I describe myself as a translator between two different cultures to explain the neurotypical world to the Aspie and the Aspie world to the neurotypical. Someone must fall in love with an Aspie, otherwise it would have died out years ago. Yeah. But what I found is the person who falls in love with an Aspie is a beautiful person, <laughs> and that's you. So when I say, yes, she has the features of autism, I'm so delighted she's in your family <laughs> because you're already an expert. Thank you. I speak Aspergerese. I was brought up in that environment and know it, and I know it not just professionally, I know it from personal and family experience. My mother married an engineer who seemed a little bit odd, aloof, austere, and was a puzzle to me to relate to. Tony grew up with a stepfather who is on the spectrum. So I think since little, he learned about how it is like to live with someone with Asperger's and therefore know, I guess, their worldview. I felt very much unwanted in the family. So I suppose in a way, I observed and analyzed the Asperger characteristics. I'd wanted to be a psychologist since I was 14. Finished a year at university and had a summer job as a volunteer in a special school. This was 1971, where we knew very little about autism. There was a child there, a little girl, five years old, severely autistic, no speech, very much in a world of her own. She loved being on the swing, so I pushed her on the swing and then she wriggled and indicating she wanted to get off. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll just sit on the swing and was just looking around, checking that she was okay. And she came up behind me and pushed me. I knew she had done that for my enjoyment. And I just felt that that was a communication. And that was it. I then decided autism is going to be my career to find out why you are like that and help you. I met Tony at a psychiatric hospital in the south of London. I was a student. He was working and also a master's student. My youngest sister was diagnosed with autism when she was about 10. I found it quite embarrassing that she was quite strange in some of her behaviour. I didn't even admit that I had a little sister for a long time. I didn't know how to deal with it when I was a young teenager. Meeting Tony was actually quite inspiring regarding my sister because he was so interested in her, so accepting of the whole family. I think it did put her in a new light for me. And in 1977, we ran off and got married. We had three children, and we had decided that we'd like to go overseas. We moved to Queensland. It was heaven. It's warm, and it's sunny, and it's so unlike Birmingham. Yeah, he's got the video camera out again. Daddy! <laughs> Come on, kids, up the drive. I'll take a picture of you. We were free-range children. And, you know, we'd come back for lunch and go out again. So my childhood was um, happy. Peanut butter. Yuck. Rosie. Yeah. Hi. Growing up in the Outwood household, Dad would often be studying, researching, reading up on things. Um, when I was very little, apparently one of the first sentences that I would go around and say was, Daddy doing the research. Daddy doing the research. <laughs> Dad was very ambitious. I knew career was a big focus for him, and it required so much brain power and empathy power as well. I think it drained him, and I think having three small kids would have been quite difficult. William, no, it's Rosie's it's turn. It's my turn, it's my turn! We started to have a few problems with Will. Very volatile emotionally, short attention span. I sort of went through school thinking of him as a bit overactive, a bit, a bit, maybe ADD. We didn't even give it a name, you know, it was just, yeah, he's a bit of a distraction. When puberty occurred, 
Anxiety didn't come in as a wave, it came in as a tsunami, and he was horrendously anxious. And he found that alcohol and marijuana gave him a level of relaxation he'd never experienced in his life. Dad saw his son doing well academically and socially, going to parties, having friends, not getting hooked on computer games. There was no real reason for him to worry or suspect anything was up with me. Yeah, well done, man. And he was very busy at that time writing the book. Tony Atwood wrote the definitive book on Asperger's syndrome that is regarded all over the world as the Bible in the homes of people that are living with and loving someone with Asperger's syndrome. I remember when I first met Tony. I was doing my master's in clinical psychology and Tony came in and gave a lecture on autism. And suddenly I was caught with the autism bug. I had to know more and I, and I haven't really got over it. Ever since a month ago... Michelle and I decided to start a clinic as a centre of excellence not only in terms of diagnosis, but also in terms of treatment. I've had a very big mind change. We did the that. world's first therapy programs for anxiety, anger, depression and affection. One of the first things that we recognise was that there can be very intense emotions. I first met Virginia in 2008 when she was nine years old. And I've been seeing her on a regular basis ever since. Tony said that it's a gift. I was a bit incredulous <laughs> even then. I still remember that, surprisingly. <laughs> and I was, wow, so it's a gift. It's something to be celebrated, nurtured, not something to be destroyed or hidden. So what we're going to do next is try and explore some things about feelings and emotions. Tony developed a program and we were asked to be a part of that. What it showed us was the degrees of emotions that Virginia would experience. And it taught us that Virginia wasn't experiencing shades of grey. Everything is either neutral or it's extreme. So if she feels happiness, she's about to burst. If she feels anger, you're looking at a volcano. Can you tell me someone that you really, really like or really, really love? Tony handed over his program to be evaluated, knowing that when you run a randomised controlled trial, you run the risk of finding that it is completely useless and it doesn't work at all. Tony's program has become part of what is considered now best practice in, in working with, with children and adolescents with autism spectrum conditions. The program really helped us to be able to evaluate what is her happiness, what is her anger, what is her sadness. I had to teach her how to be able to read people's faces. And there was times saying, Virginia, you can see the person has tears. That means they're sad, they're really sad. Or when they're smiling, they're really happy. When Virginia got really angry, we learned to walk away, and let her explode, then talk to her because if you're trying to calm her down, it gets worse. I feel everything so acutely still, but knowing the cause of, um, of, of my feelings, I know how to react to that now. I know how to respond to it. I know how to, um, how to hold it in until such time as is appropriate. Love and friendship are the most important things in life. And for someone who has autism, who can't necessarily win love and affection, this can be a recipe for deep depression and huge anxiety about who you are, what's your place in the world, do you really fit in? You are a talented photographer, but I am concerned about your happiness and your sadness and feeling very depressed. I just don't want to be here in this world anymore. I don't know why I was born with ASD. It's really gotten to me. Yeah, okay. People were coming in and saying that they were not getting better with the conventional programs. We decided to modify cognitive behaviour therapy for people with Asperger's syndrome. 
If you were going to portray your depression in photographs, what would be in the photograph? I don't know. Have a think about it. It's not dwelling on the depression. It's expressing it and getting it out of you. Okay. Tony understands the pain and what it's like to be ostracised, what it's like to be bullied. People don't understand that, you know, if you, you see the boys, it's a non-physical disability. They get a lot of judgement towards them. It's actually unpacking it and listening and understanding how they feel. Because it does, it's very raw. We found that the program was exceptionally helpful for the people who did it. They were coming out of their depressive episodes and finding a new meaning in life. Tony started to lecture to provide public speaking engagements about Asperger's syndrome. He travelled a lot. It was huge. There was one year he went to America five times. And it wasn't just America, he went to New Zealand and Japan and the UK. At the moment that Dad, his career started to take off and he was, you know, getting more and more success and recognition, simultaneously the family at home was struggling. At the age of 23, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. I just had to focus on getting through it and getting better. Then, of course, I wasn't ready to deal with the repercussions or head back into real life. Uh, and I started experimenting with drugs and that took a hold. It was an obsession. And he could tell you anything you needed to know about psychoactive drugs. It became quite a scary, scary place to be for a few years. Both Caroline and I avoided him quite a bit. We didn't really want a lot to do with him. Caroline moved away. Will has taught me aspects of life that I never thought I would be involved with. The emergency services when he's overdosed and we've got to call an ambulance. Or the police to break the door down because he's been thinking of suicide. The way I described it at the time was he was in the cab of a massive, great semi-trailer, and I'm trying to hold it back with a rope. That's what it felt like. Swinging along for the ride and just getting bashed in the process, and he was just going hell for leather. I was dealing with some pretty heavy-hitting people, and I committed a robbery to pay a debt. He's not a good criminal. He got caught. And so he went to prison, and that was it. Probably it was the best thing that could have happened to him in a strange way. He would call me from prison regularly and we would have chats and he was incredibly lucid. It was like Will at 14 before the drugs hit. It was lovely. Exactly. One Christmas when Will was in prison, Rosie, she was kind of keen for us to watch a video of all of us as kids. Wonderfully 80s, isn't it? It is. It was just a scene of him walking down the beach with his dad and not wanting to hold Tony's hand. Go on, Willie. Oh, it's your sport. I was trying to interact with him, but even at the age of four, there was a barrier. And I start imitating him. He's really very much in a world of his own. You try and engage him by doing something like kicking the water yeah. and he, he's not interested. He's very, very much got his own agenda. Rosie is a teacher of kids with autism and we just turn to each other and say, he's Asperger's. <laughs> it was a sort of a light bulb moment that we had. And so we started doing that thing, well, what about that time? And Oh my gosh, do you remember when he was an... Oh my goodness. He's getting a bit chaotic. He realised all of the patterns, the pieces of the puzzle were there. And if we'd only been able to sort of stand back, we would have seen actually he's doing all of these things because he very much fits the, the description of a, of a child with ASD. Now I can't diagnose my son. And I thought, if anybody's going to give an objective opinion, it was Winnie. Daddy, look what I found! What'd you find? Bill is someone who is very bright. He's very articulate, very smart, 
very quick to learn how to camouflage his difficulties. So he, in a way, distracted people away from his social discomfort by intellectually working ahead of what to do in a situation. You could say, well, why didn't Tony Atwood, the world leading expert on Asperger's syndrome, why didn't he recognize it in his own child? And I think it really was that it was too close to home, that when Will was a, a tiny little one, it, there really wasn't much known about Asperger's. And so Will went through most of his childhood into adolescence before anybody really knew what the characteristic signs were. Autism is a, a continuum. Okay. The severest form here and the mildest form here, Asperger's. And we began the discovery of it here. And over time, over the decades, we've moved along that line. He's up here, but when he was little, we only knew to here. So that's why we didn't pick it up. I thought that was normal to be sort of hyper aware of uh, and dissecting mm -hmm. a social situation like mm -hmm. both during the interaction which is really mm -hmm. quite difficult and then mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. I don't hold it against him in any way, shape or form for failing to diagnose me. It seems to me that for, for whatever reason my Asperger's was much less pronounced when I was a child. How did you come up with that? When I think of Will in, in his early days, there is a, a very deep sadness that in some ways I think he was crying for help and I wasn't hearing that voice. I now know what I should have done. So this incredible guilt that if I was Doctor Who with a TARDIS, I would go back to when he was three and four years old and I would have had a very different approach. So I have an apology to Will that I didn't see what I now know was there and it was there, but I didn't see it. Nowadays, with that same child, we would have taught him how to manage his frustration to sort of self-soothe and stay calm. He may even have avoided the drug path. Who knows, we'll never know. These guys ground me so much, they really do. For a long time, I blamed a lot of my drug use on the cancer, whereas it was actually the Asperger's that I think was the core reason I was using it. I feel like jail and struggling with drugs and alcohol prior to that has really helped shape my sense of identity. That was one of the first times I saw just how much my Asperger's could separate me from other people. And I also knew I needed to learn quickly and when in doubt, keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Since the diagnosis, my relationship with my father has become so much stronger and it's built on a mutual respect of me respecting his deep, deep knowledge of Asperger's and him respecting the fact that I have it. These social barriers and get close, but not breach them. Oh, I think and he's gonna need a lot of support. Like he's a long way into addiction and there's a long way out. Our main aim is to keep him alive in the hope that one day he will decide to change. If you could spend a moment in the world of autism, then you'd really appreciate how amazing it is that they keep going. So, What really helps when Tony chooses to share his story is that parents feel not so alone, that someone else is going through this, and that even the experts don't get it all right. I have a son with Asperger's, and when he got it, was and it's expensive. I think it's cathartic for him to tell people and to now acknowledge it. He's comfortable with that now. He's like, no, we don't have any reason to feel ashamed of it or to hide it. I think for him, he thinks if this can help someone else, then it's almost atonement for not stepping in early enough, not seeing it. Okay, guys, that's it. Uh, see you next time. Okay, bye. My goal now, I suppose, is I've learned so much of it. I want to pass it on and I want to pass it on to the next generation and the generation after that. Good to see you again. Okay, so just take a seat. Right, I've been looking forward to seeing you.
I think in the future, some of our major problems will be solved by people with Asperger's, whether it be pollution, electricity or whatever it may be, by somebody who thinks outside the box. In Asperger's, they say, what box? I think we need to embrace and encourage the particular abilities because our future is based on such individuals. I like animals' kindness and making the world a better place. And in a way, is Asperger's syndrome the next stage of human evolution?